Our scripture comes to us from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Just a few, three verses, uh, Paul's closing of the letter to the church of Corinth. Listen for God's word for you in these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And all the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In his various letters, Paul uh, can, he can be hard on a church sometimes. Uh, he can be rather stern. Uh, sometimes when needed, he can be very encouraging. And at the close of this letter, he is being very pastoral. He uh, is giving them the last directions from the, the letter, those closing words before he wraps it all up. And, and it's kind of, you know, when you talk on the phone, um, at least most people I know, you, you start with, you know, how, how's your family, you know, you start with the things that uh, you're supposed to, and then you get around to the, the meat of what it is the conversation is to be about, and then you come to the closing. And Paul, in the closing, always wants to remind them of the things that are most essential about life. He comes back to, these are the things you hold on to. And, and, and it's almost like a closing, like a, a goodbye. Uh, I was thinking... Um, this Sunday, we start our fifth year in ministry together, and uh, for Angie and I being here, we're at the beginning of our, our fifth year, and, and for us, that's a joy. We're excited about that, and uh, excited about the, the next chapter that uh, begins in, in the relationship that we share as a, as a church, and uh, looking forward to the new associate minister coming in next week. There, there are lots of, of, of neat and exciting things to, uh, to be looking forward to. And I was thinking about kind of at a place where uh, you're, you're looking ahead, and yet in this letter is at the close. It's at a sense of, of goodbye, the letter is. And, um, and I think in our daily living, one of the things that we could probably benefit well from is living life with a sense of being complete. Um, several years ago, I, there's a, a favorite musician I like to listen to. His name is David Wilcox, and he wrote a song, uh, Start With the Ending. Um, and, and, and in it, he talks about, well, what if we did that? What if we started with the ending? And, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we were at the place where we, we had everything. We knew what life was like. We knew all the answers. We, you know, had completed life, and then we began to work ourselves backward. He said, you know, you'd go to your first day at work. They'd give you a gold watch. You're in the corner office, you know. Uh, you know, what a way to start. And, uh, and, and then, you know, as you move through your career, you get more interested in people and uh, less in about, you know, being the, the supervisor. And, and uh, you know, you move through your career and it's, it's getting more simple and basic as you go. Um, you know, and he moves it all the way back to where at the very beginning of life, we're, uh, we're at the end, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, just learning language itself. He, he said, you know, after a whole career of work, um, then it's off the time to go to college, you know, and, and you might be able to actually learn something in college because you've got all this experience behind you to bring to bear. Um, and, 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 then, and then you just kind of, as you, you know, begin to learn simpler and simpler lessons like language itself, you uh, disappear like the glint in someone's eye. Um, you know, you, you lived it with a sense of perspective. I think too many of us live life uh, caught in the middle, anxious about where we're at, anxious about what tomorrow is, when the truth is we know the ending, right? We know the ending. 
Uh, we are children of God. We are children of God who have been embraced by Him, redeemed by Him through the cross, and that there's nothing in life that can ever separate us from that. Whatever struggles we may face, there's nothing that will ever separate us from God. And we can rest assured in that. We can know that, that bigger than this life is our eternal home, our place in God Himself, and that we rest secure in Him. And when we do so, the worries that we go through in life, they become much more simple. They really are not the kind of earth-shaking things that, um, that we sometimes feel they are in the course of life. And I think it's at it's, it's that essence that, that Paul writes this letter, and he gives this kind of basic advice to them. It's kind of a way of thinking maybe at the end of the day, of every day, is a sense of saying our goodbye, of living complete with how life is. Um, I, I, you know, I try, I mean, I, there's so much I want to do. There's so much I look forward to ahead in life. But honestly, if this were it, I would feel good about how I have lived my life. And if we, if we can say that when we get to the end of the day, how much more can it be? Loving family a career in ministry. Uh, there's so much that, that I've, I've done and been a part of that I can feel that my life really, truly rests secure in God. And I hope each of us can do that with our lives as well. Um, live at peace with ourselves and with how life has come for us. When I, I know I tell you this, it, that's one of the things about being at, in a relationship with over time is that you hear stories over and over again. Uh, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Hopefully in this case it's a good one, but I, I just remember so clearly when our, our children were young and um, they're 14 months apart. And so whenever they were little, in a way, it was kind of like Angie and I said, uh, okay, we're going to do this tag team. We'll see you on the other side when they get to be a little older, you know. And so we, you know, just went to raising them. And uh, every night, though, we would trade off going, taking them to bed. And, um, and so I'd have Thomas one night, Angie would have Anna, and we'd switch. And, and, um, and as we did... Uh, we'd always read a story with them, sometimes their favorite one, sometimes a new one, but that would be the, the close to the evening. And I remember during those days, uh, Susan uh, Stiles, uh, she'd written a little piece about how she closed the day with her children, and she would say to them, remember, you are special to God. Remember how much we love you, so sleep loose. You know, we tell people to sleep tight. And I think um, sometimes we sleep so tight and tense that we never let go of what has been uh, preoccupying us during the day. But instead, she said, sleep loose. I remember trying it for a while. Anna remembers me saying it, but uh, I, I don't know how much it took hold. But I, I like that idea that if we can come to the end of the day uh, with ourselves personally, and with our relationship and family, and be able to sleep loose, letting go of the anxiety that we carry, and just rest secure in God's love and care for us in life. What more could we want or ask for? Um, there's a beautiful peace that comes to that. Too many of us are uptight and tense and cannot find a, a way to relax. And we are... We are zapped of energy, um, all of it drained away from us because we cannot rest secure. And yet, when you read through Scripture, there's one message that seems to come back so many times, all the way from Genesis to Paul's farewell. And the message is a gospel affirmation that God's love and hope is for us and that God is with us. And if that's the case... There's really little else that can come in the way. We look for um, 
that kind of trust to be able to rest in. And when uh, Paul writes this, his future is, a, is yet to be determined, but he's still resting with security. That's not a doctrine we talk about uh, a lot in the Methodist church, eternal security. Um, one of the reasons why we, I mean, we, we, we believe God gives us a sense of free will and that we can always turn away from God's love. But if we are turned into a loving relationship with God, then I think we can, to some degree, rest secure in our relationship with God. Because it's not going to be on God's side that any uh, turning is going to take place. If there's a turning, it'll be on our side. And so we want to turn into this loving relationship with God and to find our place of security and our place of rest. It's the assurance that we get when we know that, um, that God's grace is for us. And we move from the image of God as judge to God as friend. Um, we, we need lots of images for how we describe God because God's bigger than any one of them. God is so beyond our ability to grasp, but we understand God in different ways. Sometimes, you know, when we're at a point in our life where we're really at a point of making bad decisions, we need to see God as the enforcer to keep us on the right track. Sometimes we need that image of God to be the strong one to make us do what we might not want to do, but really is what is in our best interest. But if we can never move away from that image of God as judge to where we understand God as our friend, our companion in life, who wants the best for us, then maybe we live in a sense of fear. But we really and truly should live in a relationship of of love and intimacy with God, that God is as close to us as the air we breathe. It's what we talk about when we talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is that, that God dwells within us and that we experience God fully in our lives. And that's what we are looking to. It's what we're looking to in our relationship. And so he gives them a few directions. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to go through a few of them. He says, first, Put things in order. Put things in order. Uh, that's an important place to start. Um, because if we don't have our life in order, it's easy for it to be such a mess that we are never able to focus on the most important things. We need to be able to put order to our life. And that is by putting the last things first, meaning the things that last. That we have love in our relationships with one another, that we have honesty in how we share life genuinely with each other, um, that we, we truly are at a place where uh, the, we put people before things in our lives, that, that we live with, with the most eternal things as, because they're the only things that last. Uh, our wealth we're not able to take, um, we're not able to take those prized possessions. The only thing that transcends this life are those things that are eternal, like love and our friendships and our relationship with Christ and the relationship as a family of God. Those are the things that are most central. And when we put them first, all of life uh, is in proper perspective. So we put things in order. We take care of those things. But also, we need to just sometimes clean up the sloppiness around ourselves. There is a, and, not, and not be so attached to the things that are of lesser importance. There was an American visitor who went to see the uh, famous Polish rabbi, uh, Hafez Kaiman. And when he went to his house, he saw how sparse it was. He didn't have furniture. There were very few possessions that he had. And, the, uh, and the, the visitor asked him, he says, well, where is your furniture? And, uh, and he said, well, where is yours? Uh, you didn't bring it with you, did you? And he says, well, no, I, but I'm a visitor. And he said, well, so am I. Uh, so am I. I'm a visitor here. Um, my true home is with God. Um, 
the, the things that I and we think of as so essential sometimes are just the, the mere things that we surround ourselves with, that the most important things uh, go beyond our possessions. We live with a sense of, um, of the most eternal things at the, at the core of who we are. We have to clear up the clutter, though, sometimes, because we have so much. We, if, and I'm not talking about buying another or renting another storage unit to go stick it all in, right? Uh, I, we just have too much stuff sometimes. Um, it's hard to rest secure when your bed is all cluttered up with junk, right? I mean, you've got to clear it off to be able to get a start at it. Um, there's an old story that was one, told by one of the early church leaders. A uh, story about a, a man who uh, sends his son off to, to work. And uh, he says he has this, this field that he wants cleared. And so he sends his son off to work in the, in the field. And when he gets there, he realizes it is way overgrown. I mean, it's a huge task. And he is so overwhelmed by the task, he just sits down in despair, and he sits there all day until the day is over and he comes back home. Well, he goes on doing this because he can't imagine that he can ever clear this work that needs to be done. And for days upon days, he goes and he simply sits. Finally, the father asks him how it is going, and in despair, he says, I haven't done anything because I was overwhelmed by the job. And the dad says, if you would have just cleared the space that you laid upon each day, you would have made progress toward the goal. Sometimes that's what we got to do, is just take a small chunk of the clutter around our lives and just clear it out so that we get enough space that we can breathe and we can see life and then be able to move forward in terms of bringing order. But when our life is a mess... We can never rest secure. We will never be able to. He uh, says, Paul says to them, listen to my appeal. He's given good advice. Listen to the words that he gives. Um, we can't listen unless we can learn to be quiet. The only way we can ever hear is if we stop talking. If you ever talk to somebody and you realize they only are hearing their part of the conversation. They're not hearing a word that you said. Um, in fact, they started the conversation because they wanted you to get, to get something from you. And, uh, and anything else, they just didn't hear until they got to where it was they wanted to go in the conversation. People are that way all the time. When we truly listen to one another, um, it's not so much about sharing what it is that we think is so central. Sometimes it's important to get a point across. I'm not saying we don't ever speak up. We need to speak up. There are times clearly to speak up. But sometimes we need to listen. And Paul says, listen to my appeal. When we've already got the answers, how can we ever learn what we need to learn? Because we think we already know it all. So we would I remember with Thomas particularly, he won't like my saying this, but uh, uh, he, well, actually, he's a great kid. Uh, he probably won't mind. But I remember whenever he'd lay down, sometimes he's so busy, and, and, and I don't know if you, your kids were ever this way, but that kind of energy where you're fighting off sleep, and so you're busy and active, and, and it's just like, you know, and then once, you, if you ever relax, boom, they're out, Right? Well, I, you know, the, the, the things I would say is eyes closed, mouth closed, body still. And if you could do that, eyes closed, mouth closed, body still, you're in a posture of rest and a posture of listening. It's then that we're able to listen to God. Um, we think, we get so hung up on prayer as our words and what we're telling God. And we need to tell God and share with God about what's going on in our life. And when we can truly open ourselves up to God that way, um, there, there's a beauty that's there. But there's a whole other side of prayer that's not about a word we say. It's about listening. Just think about it. 
Um, if God truly is our friend and as close to us as our closest friend, half the conversation ought to be about listening, shouldn't it? Um, maybe God has something to say to us. We have something to share. We want to share what's going on and ask God's direction for our life. But if we don't ever quieten down enough for God to, to lead us, how will we ever hear what God is saying to us in our life? Um, it might be like living with a spouse who only talks and never listens. You think about it that way? Maybe, maybe God is, is that way with us, sometimes feels like we only talk and never listen. Um, maybe sometimes we need to listen to be able to hear what it is God would say to us. To sleep loose, we listen to God's message of love for us. Paul says to agree with one another. Agree with one another. Um, sometimes there are controversial issues in the church. And sometimes we will disagree over things. I remember a church, they were voting on whether to abandon their church location and build out on a new property at the edge of town. It was a hard issue for the church because some people felt very bound to that building. And that building was the place where uh, their children had been baptized, where they had been married, where their grandparents had been a part of. And that space played a very integral part to their religious experience. And as the church went through the debate, then there were those who really, you know, they just saw this big albatross of a building that cost so much to keep up and uh, all these problems that are going to cost so much to take care of. It's just better off to go start new and build a new place. And the church gone through this big debate, big conversation about it. They finally got to the place where they voted. And they voted to make the move. But it was, it was like a 70-30 thing, you know. It wasn't everybody on board. But after they had taken the vote, and one of those who felt the strongest about staying, after it was voted that 70% they, they, uh, wanted to go, they stood up and said, can we take another vote on this? And so they did. They took another vote, and they voted 100% to make the move. Once they had made the decision, wanted to make sure that they were all in agreement together about it. Um, agree with one another. It doesn't mean we don't have differing views. Lord, please let us have differing views. How boring would it be if we all thought and looked and acted the same? Um, I, I think God causes and creates um, great diversity in the church so that we learn how to struggle with difference so that we might be able to understand more fully uh, the truth of a perspective that's other than our own. Um, we learn that way. We become a better church by being able to struggle through such issues. And we can come out together on the other side when we, when we choose to agree Agree in love with one another. Um, and that causes us to, to celebrate the difference. He says, uh, live in peace. Live in peace. John Wesley, he had three simple rules that um, he, he tried to live by. And he asked those who were a part of the early Methodist societies to live by these three rules. The first was do all the good you can. Do all the good you can, whenever you can, so far as you can, any place for any person. Do all the good that you can. And the second one was to do no harm. Um, and, and there's a part of us is to, to do no harm. Uh, to, to live in peace means that we really try not to uh, accidentally step on each other's feet. Um, or someone else's, you know. I mean, we're just, we, we really try our best to live in a way, not where we're just expressing and showing love toward one another, but where we live, where we're trying not to bring harm to one another. Uh, I, I have very strong political views, 
But I hate the world in which we live today where the person who looks and, 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 and thinks something different from a political perspective becomes your enemy. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, we bring harm to our world by thinking of those who think of, of, of politics differently than ourselves as the enemy. We bring harm to the world when we do so. God's bigger than Democrats and Republicans. Uh, God's bigger than Americans and Russians. God's so much bigger than all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, to, to live with that kind of division at the core of who we are brings harm to the world. Brings harm to our country just at a practical level. Um, but, it, it, but it truly is not God's way for how we are to be. It, if we think that someone views the world politically differently than we do is our enemy. It, it's not living in a Christian way, I think. We're to live with a sense of living with peace. Peace with ourselves and peace with each other. Uh, do no harm in how we live. Receive the gift of love. Have you... Uh, just imagine being given a gift, beautiful box and wrapped up, beautiful wrapping, the way it looks, and, and the gift is given to you, and you take it and you say, oh, well, thank you, but you never unwrap the gift. You don't know what's in it. You're never able to appreciate it or use it. Um, God gives to us universal love and grace. I believe that at the core, that God I mean, as First John says that God is love. Everything about God is about love and reconciliation. And God is giving that universally to all of us. The problem is, some of us are not opening the box and appreciating the gift. We don't understand the incredible gift that we've been given, so we don't get to begin to enjoy it. Um, Heaven doesn't begin at the end of life. It begins at the moment that we understand God's love for us and, and we begin to live it out in our lives. When we know that we've been granted grace and pardon for the brokenness we brought to the relationship with God and the world, when that's been forgiven and it is in the past, then we're able to live free and full of God's love and we get to appreciate the fullness of that gift. But some of us sit there with the gift on the table, never opening it or ever using it. And that's what hell is. Hell is when we cannot allow our relationship to God to be restored because we won't let it. We, don't, we just don't embrace the gift. Receive the gift of love, Paul says. God's offering you the gift, but you've got to take it in order to really appreciate it fully in your life. Can't enjoy it if you don't open it. And join the cloud of witnesses. That's what we're doing here together. We're joining the cloud of witnesses. We are sitting together. We are singing songs together. We are mixing our voices in harmony and a little disharmony, you know. It takes all of us. And, uh, and we sing and we, we are joining the cloud of witnesses of those who know God's grace in their life because we don't do it alone. That's an important message. It's an, such an important message to Paul that, uh, that the, the Christian faith is not a, a, an individual sport. It's a sport, if you will, that all of us have to participate in. It's a team activity. Uh, I love baseball, but I cannot play baseball by myself. It takes a team, and it takes another team to play against in order to, 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 to really enjoy it. Um, I can throw the ball in the air, and I can catch it. I can throw the ball in the air and hit it, and then run after it, and get it, but um, I can't play baseball by myself. It takes a whole team, and, and that's what part of the Christian faith is. We need one another. Um, you may think that if you're not here, no one really notices or cares. Well, the truth is, someone missed out on your insight if you weren't here. 
Um, if, if you, for whatever reason, are away, somebody didn't, may not have gotten what they needed that day uh, in terms of the connection and relationship because you have something to offer. And that is your unique perspective on what this faith journey is and what you have learned along the way. We need one another. Um, sometimes uh, we need, because there's a place in our life that someone else has something to tell us, and sometimes it's because we have a gift to give to someone else. And both parts are equally true and equally necessary. We join the cloud of witnesses. Our home is with God, and that we as a church are at home with one another. And when we know that, that we are in God's hands, and we rest secure, we are able to truly know our place and, and, and live with security in our lives. We changed up the prayer that uh, we would say with the kids from the way I learned it as a kid anyway. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's how I, I learned that one. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Guide me through the starry night and wake me in the morning light. That was the prayer how we taught it to our kids. Um, guide me through the starry night. Let me rest secure and wake me in the morning light. Bring us through to the other side. Uh, that's how we rest in God. And when we do so, we can hold our place in him just as he holds us in the family, and in his embrace. Amen.